Hello and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, Licensed Professional Counselor. My guest today is Karthik Ramanan. He is a fourth year naturopathic medicine student at the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in Tempe, Arizona, and former Goldman Sachs employee. Today, we're going to be talking about food addiction, emotional eating, and how to live a healthy, happy, and balanced lifestyle, among other topics. Karthik, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. All right. So basically, I always like to start off with a story. So before you tell me about yourself, uh, tell me how we know each other. Well, uh, as you said, I'm a student at Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine, and I have the I've had the good fortune of being taught by your wife, Dr. Nicole Kane. So she introduced us, and we've been good friends since. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, she is great, and I'm glad to hear that uh, you've had a good time working with her. Um, and I'm glad to know you. We have only known each other for, I don't know, about three or four months, but we have been communicating a lot about podcasting, video blogging, and health topics and mental health topics. So I'm excited to have you on the show. Um, uh, all right. So basically, before we get into the topics of today, let's hear a little background about Karthik. Sure. Well, um, I grew up basically with the intention of becoming a doctor through going through uh, my undergraduate education at Cornell University. I was a pre-med. Uh, when I got there, uh, basically, at that point in my life, as a 17-year-old kid, my where I was was basically I was overweight. I had been overweight since a pretty young age. Um, my hair was thinning. I didn't really have much of a self-esteem as far as what I looked like or, or that kind of thing, my attractiveness, those sort of things. But I was really good at school. So I hung my hat on that. My identity was based on that. And... Uh, well, when you go to Cornell University, all of a sudden you go from being at the top of your class, that sort of thing, to being average. Right. And I didn't take very well to that. So that was my first real uh, understanding of depression. And I got to experience that very heavily for about five years. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a topic in and of itself. However, yeah. after that... Uh, you know, life works out in funny ways, and uh, I ended up, uh, like you said, uh, going to work for Goldman Sachs. I started when I was uh, 21, just about to turn 22, young guy, and um, just worked my butt off there. But there, things changed around as far as my, uh, you know, the mental health side of things, just because all of a sudden I went from a place where I felt average and not really having an identity or a purpose to having a lot of purpose, because my managers were really appreciating the work that I was doing mm. and I derived a whole lot of meaning for that and from that and uh, life was incredible from a professional standpoint however uh, just like most everybody at uh, in that industry you know we push ourselves really really hard right and I was working anywhere from you know 12 14 sometimes 18 hours a day uh, six days a week um, and just a, trying to do my job really well, and mm -hmm. B, do side projects to make a name for myself and that sort of thing. Wow. So in doing so, uh, I think I graduated college at probably 220 pounds, and I was five foot eight. Um, and then when I was uh, basically sitting in a chair for most mm -hmm. of my time uh, at work uh, and, and not really working out or, or eating well, uh, I ballooned up to about 250 pounds. I put that on the back burner at first because, hey, my career is going well. Right. I'm feeling, you know, satisfied mentally. Uh, I was growing. And I think growing, we can get into this later, but I think growing is such a key to just feeling fulfilled and happy. And at that point, I was growing. However, I was starting to get this feeling of, oh, my God, I got to do something about my weight. And... So for, I would say, maybe a couple years into working, so probably, I think I started about 2007, was my first real, all right, I'm going to do something about my weight. Right. I went to the gym. They had a beautiful gym facility in the office. Um, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to start losing weight. And I brought my weight down to about, you know, from 250 to like 235, and that was a pretty good drop. But then I plateaued. 
and then I plateaued and I gave up and I went back. Um, the next year I tried again, uh, this time changing the diet up a little bit, eating a little healthier for what I thought was healthy at the time. And um, again, similar story, 235, 230, plateaued, came back. Mm -hmm. uh, one time I even, um, down the line, I even cut out processed foods and again, down to 230-ish, plateaued and went back. Mm. Finally, uh, I got to this point where I said, all right, enough is enough. I've got to do something significant about this. I've got to do, that was my first attempt at doing something that I thought was extreme. So I had seen advertisements for P90X and, you know, okay, like, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, something that, it's infectious. Uh, that fit people do. Right? right. And here I am as a really overweight, obese guy. And I said, okay, fine. I'm going to do it. I have, I can do it. So I did the best I could with it for one round of it, and I did. I felt amazing. I, I think I dropped my weight down to two twenty at that point, but it was like I was really fit. I was much more capable um, athletically than maybe I had ever been after one to two rounds of that. Hmm. However, my weight at one point around two fifteen or so plateaued, and it stayed there for like two months, and I got really. That was the point that, and also I had I had gone on some dates, things hadn't worked, and I was just really questioning, mm. like, you know, am I just, am I just gonna, this is what's for me, mm. you know, am I never gonna break out of this, uh, this body that I have, this mindset that I have, and also, of course, at that point, my work was kind of, um, let's just say that the growth that I had experienced in the first few years was slowing down mm. so all those factors come coming together i just started to feel a little bit resigned right so uh then i had seen my sister at the end of 2010 around the holidays uh she had come back from college to uh, see my parents so i wanted to see her then and then again for her spring break three months later at the end of march so then i went up again to see my parents and see her and and in those three months, she had lost a significant amount of weight. Oh. Not only, I would guess, 20 to 30 pounds. Not only that, um, she used to have really, really bad acne hmm. for years. Really bad. Poor thing. I mean, she tried oh, so many things. Awful. Uh, and in that three months, her acne completely disappeared. She had Im immaculate skin. And I was just shocked. I said, what did you do? Right. <laughs> Because in my head, I was like, whatever you did, I'm going to do it. Because, I, Paul, I was just at that point where I was like, I give up. This is just who I am. Moment of like despair. This moment of despair. But then I saw her and I, right. and I just decided without even language. I just, mm. you know, I didn't even have, it was faster than I could make the words in my head. I'm going to do that. Just the feeling. Just the, the feeling I had, the out. intuition that whatever she did, I'm going to do it. Genetically similar, what works for her will probably work for me. So I asked her, what did you do? And she said, oh, I just went on a raw food, plant-based diet. I said, what's that? <laughs> I said, oh, I've just been eating fresh, fresh fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, uh, just as they're found in nature, uncooked, just as they're found in nature. And I said, mm. you are crazy. What? You know, where do you get <laughs> right. your protein from? Where what do you get this? your calcium from? Where do you get right. your, you know, and all this stuff. And, um, and I said... She gave me some resources. I said, okay, fine, you know, I'm going to do it. But uh, everything up to that point, I'd grown up as such a perfectionist and um, working and going to school and working in very type A environments where you just had to be on top of your game and just a high performer. And like yourself, my self worth was based on my performance and all these things. So whenever I did exercise or diet change in the past, I was like all in, you know, I'm starting and I'm just 100%. 100%. Yeah. Like, and. Or nothing. <laughs> or, no, or nothing, right. you know, eventually. But I just had, I, I don't know where the wisdom at that point came from, but I just said, you know what, I'm, I don't have a time limit here. I don't have a time frame. I'm just going to slowly incorporate this. It's a lot to do in one shot, so I'm just going to do it slowly. I'm going to start with, at least I'm going to have a salad for lunch. Oh, okay. So That's a, a, a doable salad. goal. A doable goal. Right. Like, you know, something that's small and attainable. So I did that for like the first week, uh, starting April 1st of 
2011. I did that for the first week. Had a salad. And the first couple of days, I was like, oh my God, I'm so hungry. You <laughs> right. know, I'm this big guy. I can't eat a little salad, you know. and uh, But, you know, I stuck it out. And, and uh, eventually, the salad started uh, fulfilling, like nourishing me more. So I said, all right, this is good. End of the first week. And I wasn't, mind you, I was not weighing myself during this time. I weighed myself before, okay. but I didn't want it to screw with my head. So I said, I'm just going to do it. That's something we might want to touch on later. But Definitely. how weighing yourself can actually be a false um, sign of how you're actually doing. Because I've heard, and you're a medical student, so you might be able to know, that muscle actually weighs more than fat. And so sometimes when people work out, they're gaining weight and they're trying to lose weight, but they're, um, you know, getting thrown off track because of that. So we'll discuss that maybe a little bit later Definitely. about how maybe it's about how you feel right. instead of trying to look at the scale for answers. Okay. Exactly. So I just exactly. want to throw that in there for our listeners. So when uh, I didn't step on the scale uh, during this week, and then the second week I said, wow, you know, I feel really good. So I think I'm going to eat everything raw all my snacks dinner lunch the salad for lunch but i'm gonna give myself two cheat meals per week okay totally doable right yeah because i was feeling so good you know so uh tuesday lunch rolled around and i was like all right tuesday and friday are gonna be my cheat meals so tuesday for lunch uh across the street from the office in downtown manhattan where i used to work um there was this place called blockheads and they used to serve these just big ass burritos, like just <laughs> giant, like monstrosity of like a fifteen dollar burrito. And uh, so I used to get that, um, you know, a version of that modified version of that. And I, uh, I took it back to my desk and started eating as I was working and working my way through this giant burrito. It took forever, and <laughs> afterward, I just like that was. It was as if I had eaten Indian food. It was like oh, <laughs> it was right. such a food coma. It was um, it was hard to make it through the rest of the afternoon. And I went home that evening, and I, I didn't even I don't think I even had dinner that night. And I said, "Wow, I feel like crap. Hmm. I feel like utter crap after eating that." Wednesday, ate raw, felt great. Thursday, ate raw, felt great. Friday was like cheat meal number two. So I went right back to Blockheads, ordered the same thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, and then Friday afternoon, I was like, "Oh my god, I'm so done. I can't. I can't. I can't do this. I can't." Do so after that, that was perfect because then at that point, I said, "I just feel better when I'm eating this, you know, real food stuff, uh, stuff that grows out of the earth." So I'm just gonna do that next week. Mm. So the third week, I just ate all raw food, and I I started noticing, yeah, my clothes are fitting different. So after three weeks, I said, all right, I'm 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 ready. I'm going to step on the scale because I'm really curious now. Right. And I stepped on the scale, and in three weeks, I had lost 10 pounds. And at that point, I was at the lowest point, lowest weight I had ever been as an adult. Oh, my goodness. What a, what a moment. <sighs> I it's tell you. It's incredible. I tell you, if, if, and this is what I hope to achieve with, all of my patients or anybody I ever speak to uh, in the audience, that moment that I had where I looked at the scale and then I looked in the mirror and I believed for the first time in my life that I could have the body and have the life that I always wanted, that it was possible. Hmm. I believed it was possible. It was so powerful, and that, it's not one of those things that you can, that I've ever been able to recreate with affirmations or whatever, right. but that moment of belief where the door is open, the future is yours, it's yours to take, there's, it, here's the blueprint, Yes. go for it. It's like a transcendent moment, an it epiphany. Was amazing. It was amazing. Right. And so what I, what I did at that point was like, oh, hey, you know what? I'm just going to release all expectation. And I think looking back now, that was also another key factor, releasing expectation. 
and, and I just went forth and said, whatever happens, let it unfold. I'm so excited by this. So I would bring my you know, green juices to the office and, <laughs> and you know, my colleagues would look at it and be like, what's that? You know, and then a, a few of them, um, you know, uh, would pull me over to the side over the coming weeks and stuff and say, hey, uh, Karthik, I'm trying to lose some weight for this upcoming wedding. Uh, can you help me out? I'm trying to fit in clothes. So I said, uh, yeah, sure. And I'd just, you know, bring, uh, give them recipes or bring some food to work and that kind of thing. And, hmm. um, and then the crazy things started to happen. Uh, some people took it a little more seriously than others, but I saw uh, type 2 di- diabetes go away, hypertension. Oh my goodness. Cholesterol issues, chronic migraines, chronic joint pain. And I was like... People are reporting this to you? Yeah, the they're office. like, you know, my, my low back, it's been bothering me for years. Now it's gone. What? Yeah. <laughs> you became the guru of raw food or something in your I, office. I guess. Like, and I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, right. now it's a different well, story. Sure, you, but, you know. I like, mean, the, un, the happenstance guru. Right. right. So at that point, I was just giving people recipes. Like, I wasn't, you know, nothing else. Sure. Um, and some of the changes were just from, like, very minor shifts in, in diet. Like, changing one meal per day. Like, hmm. It was very manageable stuff. Right. Anyway, so that got me thinking, like, wow, what is disease? Like, is disease just, I'm talking about chronic disease, right? Mm-hmm. Is it is it something that your body just naturally breaks down like a car? Or is it that we've, we're just not giving our bodies what they were biologically designed to subsist on, oh. to thrive on? Hmm. Do we get a headache? due to a lack of Advil, mm-hmm. right? And these questions started to come to my mind. Now, in parallel to all this, my mom at the point at that point was 58, and she'd been working uh, at a, uh, uh, a large technology company for, uh, I would say, I don't know, 15, 16 years at that point. And uh, she's working 60 hours a week, a high-stress job, uh, and yeah, just five foot three, she was 205 mm, pounds. Yeah. Again, high stress. I was getting worried that we wouldn't have her for much longer if mm. she continued the way that she was. Yeah. Um, because she was in so much pain, even just walking around. Oh my um, goodness. If I drove her to the grocery store, uh, she would ask me to drop her off at the front door because if I parked in the parking lot, and she had to walk the extra hundred feet. That would hurt her feet, and she would yell at me for that. You know, oh if, if I did that, it's like, no, leave me at the front door, please. So, uh, I mean, I was really worried. But she saw my sister's change, and she saw my weight change. And by this time, it was noticeable. Like, right. you know, people were noticing, like, hey, you, whatever. You, that's why they were asking me for help, right? So she noticed this too, and she said, hey, Carthy, can you help me? I said, yeah, absolutely. So I bought her a juicer. And she just started um, incorporating juices or replacing meals with juices or doing very short uh, juice fasts, but uh, basically increasing her micronutrient intake and replacing processed foods and and dairy and and those sort of things. So um, fast forward to Mother's Day of 2012 at this point. She's been doing this for like 10 months. She's lost 80 pounds. What, excuse me? She's lost 80 pounds. She looks, 15, oh my gosh. she looks 15 years younger. Wow. She comes down to visit me uh, in, in Jersey City. She comes down to visit me for Mother's Day. And we walk on the boardwalk up and down the Hudson River for 15 miles. 15 miles. For the woman that couldn't walk the hundred feet without her feet painting, hurting. This is incredible. This is almost like a whole new life. And that was exactly it. So at the, at the, so we we took a walk, we stopped and uh, to, to eat, and then came back. And, and when we stopped, she said, "Karthik, you've given me a life I didn't think I had left. Mm. I can't thank you enough." And 
when your own mother says that, Life doesn't get much better than that yeah. <laughs> in that moment. Um, uh, that was the most fulfilling moment uh, I can re ever remember. And I had had similar comments from um, some of my coworkers, not to that extent, right, but sure. you know, like, like I never thought I would be able to lose this weight, or I feel so great, I didn't think I could. And uh, you know, thanking me for that, and I realized. This is so gratifying. But when my mom said that, I said, I have to change my career. I have oh, to do wow. this for a living. This is so fulfilling. And it, it touches me at my core. And it gives me meaning beyond anything. I have to do this. So that's when I, I, uh, I quit medical. Well, I sorry. I quit. Uh, I left my job at Goldman. I applied. Um, well, I applied. Sorry. I applied to medical school first. Sure. Then left my job and uh, moved out here to Arizona to uh, become a naturopathic physician. So this is a watershed moment. I mean, you had your moment where you felt hope. You felt, oh my gosh, I have options now. Uh, I mean, we'll get into self-esteem. I mean, but it seems like all of a sudden you had some confidence um, just by changing your diet. Uh, and then you had your mother who you were worried about. And then, oh my gosh. 80 pounds, and I believe you said 10 months. It's incredible. And for the person that gave you life to say, you've given me a new life. I mean, this is existential, transcendent, beautiful transformation going on here. And then all of a sudden, I, I believe that's what they call vocation. I uh, need to look up the quote, but there's a quote by Parker Palmer that says something like, vocation is kind of what finds me it's what my life is speaking um it's been speaking it all along i just hadn't heard it until that moment hmm. so you had a career at goldman sachs now for those who don't know who goldman sachs is google it one of the most successful financial firms in the united states pretty good career manhattan where, what street was your office on uh, 200 West Street, yeah. Okay, so you weren't, Downtown. we weren't on Wall Street, we're close. We're close, close yeah, enough. It's, it's all... Good walk there. Yes, okay. you could. But anyway, in the, in the financial district, yeah. in Manhattan, in New York, you know, one of the most famous cities, and, but something wasn't right, it wasn't, it wasn't... Well, I'll tell you what, um, the, it, it, it's not even just, um, I, I think it was, it was... It wasn't just the body. It was just something about... There's an incongruency here because... So the first few years of my career, I was living in... Uh, uh, in uh, Further into New Jersey to try to save a little bit of money and mm -hmm. pay off my student loans and, and that kind of thing. Uh, eventually got a promotion um, through the efforts that I put in and uh, moved, you know, closer... Got a nice apartment. I just I remember this moment when I was uh, 27 years old, and uh, I had just moved into the 30th floor of a brand new high rise apartment complex. I was the first tenant in that apartment, uh, mm. and this it was a little studio, 500 square feet. Sure, it's tiny, sure. but it was gorgeous. Uh, wall to wall, floor to ceiling window oh, on the wow. entire side on the 30th floor. Facing west, mm -hmm. so facing the sunset, overlooking New Jersey, and there were no other buildings of that height near me. So I ha I was literally on top of the world. Yeah. It was an incredible view that I had from there. And I remember after a little while, you know, I'm, I'm there. I've... You know, I'm making six figures. I'm 27. I've paid off my undergraduate debt. I've paid off my parents' credit card debt. I've given way more to charity than I ever dreamed I could do at that point in my life. Yeah. And it's like, it looks like success, right? Sure. But I looked in the mirror and I hated the man in the mirror. Mm. You know, because he was overweight. This was before the, the weight loss, right? Right. He was overweight at just tired looking, lonely, mm -hmm. really lonely, and just filled with shame. Mm. So people don't know this, but uh, I, in that apartment, I would not leave over the weekends. Oh my. I would 
I, even to just take my trash to the disposal right across the hall, I wouldn't do it unless I had to leave the apartment. I didn't want to be seen. Mm. So I, I would order takeout, or order delivery, rather, from a restaurant that was right across the street that I could see from my window just because I didn't want to leave the place. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my coworkers, I never let them into my personal life. I, I was filled with that kind of shame, right? And it was... So the, the, the weight loss through the nutrition yes. helped change a lot of that. But I, looking back, I realized that it was really the shift in mindset that preceded all of it. Um, and, you know, we can certainly get into some of that yes. stuff too. Yes, I love mindset. Okay, yes. I, 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 I'm not a doctor, so I, I don't know everything about nutrition. I'm married to a doctor, so I hear a lot about nutrition. Um, <laughs> but I, I love the mental health component and how you're bringing together body and mind in your story. Yes. Because I see in my mind, and I wasn't there, but in my mind, I see this picture of you that you painted of, of staying in your apartment when if people had interviewed you back then and you were just sort of telling your story about Goldman Sachs and making this money and living in New York, they would say, oh my gosh, you've achieved the American dream. Right. You're, this is amazing. This is great. And it's all surface. But I hear this division, um, what, what people have called a divided life, where here I am successful at work and financially, and the surface looks good, but yet I feel dead inside. Yeah. And not only did you have that difficulty wondering, you know, what am I doing this for, but also this body shame, body image, right. loneliness, um, emotional, you know, downside to to the whole experience it was almost like i don't know if you would call it a trade-off but it was almost like you were sacrificing some of your physical health to maintain this 18 hour work uh day i don't or something like that does that resonate i'm not trying to read minds but that you've told me a little bit about that yeah yeah for sure um you know i i think i think we get really caught up in our society about this concept of right and wrong mm -hmm. and uh, good and bad and that kind of thing. Honestly, I think everybody, uh, all those things are, are based on a person's perspective. What's right for me is not right for you necessarily. Uh, sure. That kind of thing. So, you know, just, I, I wouldn't go and say that I did the wrong thing by spending so much effort on my, uh, career at that point sure. but the truth is it was it's cause and effect so you you spend that kind of effort in that kind of environment you will get the results commiserate for 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 uh or that are uh in line that, with, that your you, in line with your efforts in that area but you are right. yeah i mean if but if if that comes at the cost of you taking uh. effort in another area then you will feel the negative effects of that so it was really just a matter of reprioritizing that, okay, you know what? Uh, if I don't have my health, I have nothing. I have uh, nothing without my health. Yes. So what is the point of any sort of uh, success if I am not going to be able to enjoy it? And what's the point if I'm able to buy all these toys and guitars and stuff like that, that I, uh, anything that I want to learn and then not have anybody to play guitar mm. too like it so i had to really just reevaluate my whole life and say hey you know what but the 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 raw food diet just kind of fell into my lap and i think that, right. that decision just it was made easy and i just went with it and just let whatever happens happen well you know it's interesting that you say it was easy but because <laughs> i want to say for a lot of people eating raw food and drinking juices probably sounds terrible i'm not gonna lie and um I, when was first introduced to this, I was not a fan of it at all. But um, And I don't have a full raw food diet or drink juices, but I certainly eat a lot more of it than I did um, years ago instead of just eating chicken and cheese or whatever else we eat here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but it really does make you feel better. But I, I, I hear this, you know, I hear something had to change. It was like something was there, and all of a sudden you see your sister 
and you you have some hope, then you do it. Oh my gosh, there's results. And then you go back to eating the giant burrito from Blockheads. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like, oh yeah, well, yeah, it is an emergency, isn't it? See, yeah, it's exactly. it's But how, how terrible do I feel? What am I doing? Right. So these existential questions were there. And for some people, I think in our society, I, I think it, sadly uh, with success, they uh, develop the ability to compartmentalize and, and push aside those, those, those life questions. Because what are we here for? What am I doing with my life? What, what really brings me joy? Like you said, playing guitar with somebody, going out of your apartment and, and, and having fun with your friends, being able to, to do something physical with your body right. that you weren't able to do, and, and, and the joy of being alive versus the joy of financial and um, vocational success in that way. And so something had to shift, and then you say it was easy, but it was easy once you started doing it, but... There are these opportunities that come to us if we're listening and if we're open. Yes, but a lot of times, and this is not a stereotype, but I mean, I think you don't have to hit rock bottom to listen to the opportunities. But sometimes it takes really being miserable for a while right. for us to find out that there are other possibilities. Now, if you're not really miserable out there, one thing you can do to listen for possibilities is really challenge yourself. Am I listening? Am I really listening to what people are telling me? And if these people are toxic in my life, am I going to find people examples of what I would want to live like? And am I really listening to them? Right. Or am I filtering it? And it sounds like what happened somewhere in there is you really listened. I don't know if that was how you were your whole life, but you were really listening and then you put it into action. And now here you are, and you can talk more about your story, but inspiring people, um, getting your medical degree, uh, trying to really fight for a bigger mission, not just for every patient, but what I'm hearing is you're putting your message on the internet, which we'll get to, and you are wanting to change anyone, help anyone change who's listening out there uh, about what we're putting in our body affects everything. And when you feel good in your body, it's, it's easier to live a happy life. And then, of course, working on mindset. Mm-hmm. Is, a, is, a, is mindset and mental health, when you put time into it, you get results. Right. <laughs> if you don't put time into it, you usually get negative results. And it's the same thing with eating. Mm-hmm. And those are, are somewhat lost arts in our culture. Although there, there's, of course, a renaissance of trying to do that as well at the same time. So, well, what, what else is on your mind before? Anything else I'm missing or you want to contribute to your story about where you how you came from there to now yeah so well uh well i told you about how um really shy and full of shame that i was right in terms Mm -hmm. of uh living in a shell well when i came to medical school uh i I had this this moment actually when i so again moving from new jersey had uh the movers take all my stuff i had my bag i was going to get on the plane that day and 2013 April and uh, fly over here and I was on the plane and I realized like wow there's nobody in Arizona knows me well mm-hmm. my sister sure okay. and the owner of uh, this one restaurant that was it <laughs> <laughs> you know and like nobody at, at the college that I'm going to the medical school knows me and uh, like wow that's a real opportunity because Nobody's going to filter me through the lens of what I was. Because even, even uh, um, at work, right, uh, though I was becoming this new person, it's still in the context of what we also knew where he used to be. So there's that, you know, they were inspired by the change or still, you're still viewed within the perspective of what somebody knows about you entirely. Sure. But at this new place, nobody knows me. And I had this moment on the plane where, like, I have this opportunity. Hmm. So what I did was I thought about, okay, well, what does Dr. Ramanan of the future look like? Wonderful. What is, so instead of trying to change who I was, I said, what does the future version of me look like? This perfect version of me. Not perfect, but, you sure. know, whatever. Ideal. Like, if sure. I, uh, and um, so I said, well, let's see. What would he... How would he eat? 
how would he exercise what are his routines what are his habits what are his mindsets how does he treat people you know how does he challenge himself what are some of the things that he would have done in medical school all of these things i started outlining what is this person what is this ideal version of myself look like and then i did that exercise and then i said okay which one of these things can i do right now and i just started doing a lot of those actions right away what you know when i landed and started living here and that's when i started to really shift uh mindset especially yes living outside of my comfort zone so here i was somebody that the biggest leadership position i had ever had was president of chess club in high school right <laughs> you know did nothing in college extracurricular no sports teams no nothing you know and um uh and i said okay you know i'm gonna come here and i'm gonna join the student government association yes i'm gonna become student government president student government president 400 <laughs> students you know That's awesome. it still blows my mind the guy that couldn't leave his apartment is now yeah you know um, so I started pushing myself outside of my comfort zone. I found love. I mean, everything was, uh, an incredible growth from being here at the same time. The flip side of that is I also started straying away from some of the lifestyle habits uh, yes. that got me here in the first place. So at one point I had lost a hundred pounds. Yes. Right. But, uh, I, again, started to shift away from some of those habits. Look, medical school is a stressful place. Sure. So we all struggle in different ways. In my case, what I started recognizing is that um, as stress started to accumulate, I went back to very old ingrained patterns of mm. how to deal with it, which mm -hmm. is eating. Yes. And though my diet is no longer a raw food diet, but, uh, you know, it's still a, a, a plant-based diet. But what I started consuming in moments of stress was definitely not healthful food. Um, and very basically micronutrient, relatively micronutrient poor calorie dense food that just, right. you know, it, it's comfort food, right? Right. Um, and, uh, and I would just go at it too much and before i knew it uh, you know as a fourth year student i'm looking at it going gosh i've regained 70 pounds oh my goodness i mean talk about yo-yo effect that's not good so i appreciate you sharing that for our listeners because i know that you're an inspiring person but i i think it's so important for people to see that there's <clears throat> there's always another journey we're on Whenever one journey ends, another one begins. Absolutely. And whenever one challenge ends, another one begins. But that can be something we can look at, like you were looking at your idealized version and creating this new person who had this new mindset because of what change had started in you. Right. And that we're all human and we all have struggles and we all have difficulties. And when stress hits, that's when we go back to our baseline behaviors. Exactly. And so exactly. You, you, and that's something I had to realize because once I came here, you know, the story that I was telling you earlier about my transformation, I said, I, I made it. You know, that was that feeling of like, sure. I finally got the body in the, the, that I always wanted. And then a wonderful relationship and everything is yes. great. Right. Um, well, yes. <laughs> and if you want to stay there, you have to continue what got you there. It's <laughs> right. not like you just made it and, and everything is, um, you know, so I think I, and for the longest time I was beating myself up again because it's one thing mm. when you lose weight the first time, you know, you're, you're bumping your head against the wall until you find the way that works for you and then you get it. Right. And then you're happy. But when you're losing weight the first time, like I said, I had no expectations. Sure. So I was excited. When you regain it, there's two problems. One, the strategy that got you there is no longer new and exciting. Mm. And two, even worse, you say, you idiot. How did mm. you let this happen? Negative self -talk. All the negative self-talk started coming back. The negative so, narrative. The negative narrative. Mm. And that only accelerated things um, until I had to get to this point more recently where I said, okay, you know what? What if something good came of this? What if I could, in my future self say five years from now, sure. look back and say, oh my God, I'm so glad that you went through that. 
what if that was the case, you know, what could I gain from this? And I realized, yeah, well, you know what? I can now relate again to people who struggle with their weight, who struggle uh, with self-image. Yes. And it allows, it's kind of like when I went back and had the blockhead burrito to remind myself <laughs> what shitty food, you know, <laughs> right. felt like, right. you know, uh, <laughs> It's kind of like, you know, I went back in time a little bit to re-experience these things and now going through, you know, call it whatever, phase two or the next stage. The transformation is, it, it's, it's, an, it's a journey. It's not yes. like this one thing that just happens. I thought it was. But now I realize it's a journey and it's a beautiful journey. Like I'm through, through where I am right now, I'm able to reconnect with more people than I was able to when I was uh, leaner Karthik. So... I'm happy about that. That's yes. pretty cool, you know? Yes. Uh, so basically, that's where I am right now. Um, I had promised myself prior to coming to medical school that I was going to graduate healthier than I came in. So I'm making that happen. So, and we're going to talk about how you're making that happen in just a minute. I wanted to comment, though, that you said, what if I could take this sort of what I'm viewing as a negative thing? I had this mindset shift, so I've got all these friends. I've got a, a beautiful person I'm spending my uh, life with. Um, but I gained 70 pounds back. How can I turn this sort of shadow side of myself, this sort of, you know, eating or whatever happened to me and the stress, uh, gaining the weight, how can I turn that into something good? How can I bring my darkness, my shadow into the light again? Right. And so I think that's something that is making meaning out of difficulty. And that is such a key concept to mindset and, and, uh, and mental health is that when you can turn, when you've, when you've been in the darkness and you've been in the, in the valley and you've been on that, that road that was just terrible, the desert, so to speak, right. you can then empathize with other people going through difficult times and you can see where they're at instead of just going, oh, well, sorry to hear that. Right. You know, giving some sort of surface pat right. answer. We can really go there and empathize and you're going to be working with patients who are going to be coming to you with this, I mean, this is one of your specialties. I mean, you have several knowledgeable person, but emotional eating, food addiction, gaining weight. And, and yeah, when you had lost that hundred pounds, huh, I don't even, you know, it's like, do I even remember what it was like? I mean, yes, you do, but it's like that, you know, that newfound experience is just so powerful. And now having gained that back and I know now we're in the process of losing it mm -hmm. again with your, with your uh, project I want to talk about here in a minute. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, how powerful the mind is and this exercise. Who taught you that exercise anyway? <laughs> Five years in the future, uh, Dr. Ramanan, uh, looking back, what does he want uh, me to see? Who, who taught you that? Uh, it just came to me. Okay. I was sitting on the plane and I, and I was like, wow, nobody knows me. And it, well, what is, what does Dr. Ramanan look like then? I, I love it. That's all it was. I love it. And it just it, came to me, it, but it's it's been the most powerful exercise I've ever done. I I love it. I hope our listeners will will do something like this in, in their uh, spare time. And then what I also heard you do was you didn't just get grandiose about Dr. Ramanan. Sure, you had ideal Dr. Ramanan, but you said, wait a minute. So if five years from now Dr. Ramanan has all these things going on, what is something I can do right now? Something practical, simple that I can start implementing. And then slowly, it looks like those habits started paying off. And you created the person you want to be. Although you can never predict the trials and the difficulties and the challenges of the journey, you can say, this is my journey, this is my narrative, and I'm taking this narrative back from the negative self-talk, the negative voices, my difficult experiences. I'm not going to let them drive my life. I'm going to drive my life. Right. So, awesome. I want to hear all about what you're doing right now. Well, what I'm doing right now is uh, addressing addressing the food addiction that I realized that I've been uh, allowing myself to fall victim to, really. And uh, it, was, it was really, a lot of it was inspired by a podcast that I listened to uh, on a Rich Rolls podcast with uh, this guy, Andrew Taylor, mm -hmm. who 
the, the topic of that was was food addiction and they brought up this point that i it was rolling around in my head but not in these words until they kind of said it and it just awakened me you know if you're trying to if you're addicted to cigarettes yeah you can quit smoking it's hard but you can do it if you're addicted to alcohol you can stop drinking it's hard but you can do it yeah uh same for a lot of addictions you can get but if you're addicted to food you can't just stop eating right <laughs> so <laughs> like what do you do right and <clears throat> so uh, andrew taylor's approach was okay well if i can't eat if i can't quit eating then i'll just eat one food so he ate potatoes for a year oh and right lost over 100 pounds spud and, fit yeah spud fit yeah lost over 100 <laughs> pounds and uh you know no longer depressed and amazing story so uh that got me thinking well okay uh, rewind a little bit my first year in medical school in in an effort to uh just push my limits as far as uh, what i thought i was capable of and reaching higher states of mental and uh, mainly for mental clarity and spiritual clarity, I did a 108-day juice fast ah. while I was in school, which was an unbelievably fulfilling experience. Yes. Uh, and at the same time, it was a giant commitment, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, was, that was a beautiful thing. But I, after listening to that episode with, uh, with Andrew Taylor more recently... And again, I said gained seventy pounds uh, since uh, you know in the last couple of years, and I realized, you know what, to get an extreme result, I've got to take an extreme action. Mm -hmm. To that, that for me, moderation just does not work. I just have to go all in because if I do one of these, oh, I'll do this, I'll give myself a cheat every so often. The problem is the next day. I said, well, I cheated yesterday. I'll just start tomorrow. Right. I'll Why start not? tomorrow. I'll start tomorrow. But when I have hard and fast rules, I'm like, well, you know what? It, I, I'm i just sticking to this because this is the rule. So what I, and I really started to dissect, okay, what is it about food that I'm addicted to? Well, yes, there are, you know, different foods cause different uh, neurochemical pathways to fire different foods have a different effect on your microbiome which affects your mood and all that stuff and all that aside what is it specifically on a very fundamental level and i realized it was chewing mm. because even when i was uh, back at goldman if i was very stressed and working on something i still i had to be munching the whole time at the office i just had to be munching on something right right and uh, now I realized, okay, you know what? When I'm, when I'm happy, I celebrate with food. And when I'm sad, I numb myself with food. When I'm uh, with other people, eat out together. When I'm by myself, I eat too much. And then I continue to eat. I eat too fast. I don't chew well enough. And I eat too much, hmm. way beyond what I need to. I know I'm full. I know I'm nourished. And I still keep eating because it's easier to numb myself that way. Right. And I had to do something about it. So I said, all right, if chewing is the root of this, then I'm just not going to chew. And I, didn't, I said, okay, I did a 108-day juice fast, but I'm right. not going to do that. I it, Instead, I am just going to juice and blend all of my, you know, basically smoothies, soups. So making smoothies and soups yeah. that are... <clears throat> don't have chunks in them you've blended right. it okay. exactly so uh, basically chewing everything can be consumed without chewing um in an effort to i mean one of the nice byproducts of that is that inherently i i'm not going to blend nachos <laughs> right <laughs> so like inherently e eating more you know whole foods uh and then also uh, you just naturally have a a system for caloric restriction there because I'm not going to unnecessarily go to a restaurant to eat food on the way home or pick up food on the way home. Right. Unless it's one that I can, you know, get a smoothie or a juice or something like that. So, uh, 
I'm not giving myself an opportunity to overeat because I have to blend it or it has mm. to be blended or juiced. So in any case, I said, all right, 108 days, I'm going to not chew. And along the way, I said, just like the 108 day juice fast where I blogged about it back then, right. but I'm going to take it up a level, uh, step out of my comfort zone and I'm going to make a daily video. So, uh, that's what I've been doing. I've been, I've been, uh, not chewing and I've been making a daily vlog and it, posting it to, uh, my, uh, my channel. And I've been watching it. Um, and the name of your, blo uh, vlog, I suppose, video blog is called Vicarium. So if people are interested, they can Google Vicarium, which I can't, what does that mean to you, Vicarium? Uh, yeah, so... It was uh, actually, it, it, it goes back to that exercise that I did on the plane mm -hmm. of uh, the future self, the ideal future self. Um, basically, it's it's eum, like planetarium, aquarium, mm -hmm. a place of. Sure. Uh, and then the, the root word vicarious. The idea, it, what I did with that exercise was I designed my future self and I lived vicariously through my future self. Ah. And that is that is what vicarium is all about—a place to live vicariously through your ideal self. And your ideal self is also seems to be a compassionate individual who is not negatively self-talking you through this. Is Correct. this what I'm hearing? Absolutely. Because sometimes Absolutely. people have this other self they're talking about, and it's the judge, and it's the never good enough moving target person. So when you invented your ideal self which you invented, it wasn't just a negative voice in your head. It was, this is a compassionate, intelligent, loving individual, and therefore, I'm hearing, I'm not sure if this is what it was, but it allowed you to love yourself where you were at. A compassionate individual who loves, in this case, myself. A compassionate individual that, that can love themselves is, I think, more capable of doing great things than any perfectionistic mindset. Yes. Um, I, listen, I grew up with a perfectionistic mindset. It still lives in me. I still have to notice it and move past it, forgive myself and move past sure. it, right? Um, there's certainly been environments full of perfectionism. It's it's almost like a macho thing to say I'm my own worst critic. Sure. Like, oh yeah. You know, I'm so hard on myself. Like, cause I'm, <laughs> you know, cause I, yeah. you know, that, that's what you got to do to be great at what you do is just be hard on yourself. I no. punish myself. I ran no. the stairs. No, like it, that, yeah. that's not, it's perfectionism is, is just a, a, a coping mechanism for mm -hmm. something underlying that you just haven't addressed, you know, some insecurity you haven't addressed how, so instead of that, why not design a version of yourself that can notice when you're being hard on yourself? Because, listen, the judge, the critic, they might actually, every so often, might point out something that's legitimate. Sure. Most of the time it's probably not, at least not for me. But every so often there's... So, at least to be able to say, oh, you know what, that's a good one. I wouldn't word it that way. <laughs> but that's a, that's a good point. All right, I understand. You may leave now. Yes. And just... When when you have a slip up to forgive yourself, I spent two years regaining this weight, not forgiving myself, and now finally, I'm forgiving myself for it, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. So I'm gonna just jump on that. How I'm reading that is through loving yourself, you were able to love others and do this career shift and find love. Yes. And through loving yourself, you were able to not indulge the critic and judge maybe listen to a point and then try to make it constructive and through forgiveness of self that is how you were able to keep going that's how you were able to persevere on day what is this day what what are we on out of on 156 on day 56 and persevere through this because i know from watching your video blog that you have had plenty of bad days okay. where you wanted to you know I don't know, eat some sort of vegan cheesecake or something, you know, <laughs> right. to, screw this. Yeah. I'm going to go, I need a burrito or whatever, yeah, you know, exactly. I mean, really, I mean, it's a restrictive thing and we're <clears> used <throat> to eating. Uh, so I can only imagine, you know, the difficulties, especially when you're starting out. And so I think that's an important theme in, um, 
for mental health is love and forgiveness because if you actually love yourself then you can love others yeah and it's hard it's hard to do that um i wanted to <laughs> let listeners know what the name of your 108 day juice fast is <laughs> right well since it's a uh... Since it isn't just a juice fast, I'm oh, just, I'm sorry, I'm not. That's uh, right, blended chewing, foods. Blended, blended food. foods. My bad. Uh, it is a mastication vacation. Yes, and for those so. of us who don't know what that word is, what is mastication? Mastication is chewing. Okay, right. So, it's a medical yeah, term. Matter, for, yeah, well, it's a mastication vacation. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we should say disclaimer. Disclaimer. Work yeah. with a naturopathic doctor, right, in your area, yeah. if you are going to do one of these uh, mastication vacations. Um, so yes. I go ahead. I love it. Yeah. None of this is medical advice. Oh yeah. You I'll know, say that at I, the end. Don't worry. But okay. I just good. wanted to make sure, you know, cause some people might, uh, just stop the podcast now and start going to blend up whatever they got. In their oh, cupboard, right, right. Right. Which understood. Yeah. <laughs> and you have a doctor. I'm, yes. I'm assuming uh, yes, you're yes. being monitored and being, all that. I am being supervised. Yes. So, and I love, I love your video blog. So I'm hoping people will check it out. It'll be online forever. As long as YouTube's a, a thing, yeah, uh, and it you chronicle not only what you're eating and or, <laughs> what you're drinking. Look how uh, look how um, inherent that the word, word is, is to yeah. my brain. Right. Okay. Back to mindfulness. Uh, you chronicle what you're drinking, mm-hmm. and you also talk about mindset, mental health, and a lot of other cool topics, emotional um, coping skills, healthy and balanced lifestyle. And so, yeah, great work. I think you're doing great work for the community. And I'm excited to see, as a doctor, what you're able to do with um, the people coming to you and uh, also with becoming kind of a public spokesperson for, um, I don't know, what what are you a public spokesperson for? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Hmm. <laughs> That's a very good question. I think... It's, you know, like obviously living through our ideal selves, but uh, I, I really want to inspire people through imperfection. That, you know, there, there are plenty of great doctors out there that provide incredible uh knowledge and insights on nutrition and sleep and all these other lifestyle medicine factors that that play into our lives i want to show people the daily aspect of it that there are a lot of beautiful things and there are a lot of difficult things and uh, i want to be just a living example of what it looks like it's not perfect Right, and the beauty is in the imperfection. It's like one of our favorite books, uh, Dr. Brene Brown's uh, uh, "The Gifts, the of, gifts imperfection, of Imperfection." Right? Yep. It's um, but it's it's embracing. I want to be a spokesperson, basically, for uh, allowing people to see themselves as something greater than they are. Because I truly believe, after all that I've been through, that if I can go through this. If I can go from that guy that was filled with shame, filled with depression at one point earlier, Mm -hmm. filled with self-doubt, self-loathing, that put on a face to be really successful in in his career, but, you know, like you said, living like a split life, Mm -hmm. a divided life. And, but if I can go from that to just say, okay, the past is the past, The future does not have to be a reflection of the past. I can create my life. I want to help people get there. Yes. And I believe that is just so needed in our culture. And I thank you so much for devoting your life and career to this. Um, It is so needed in a culture where advertising and marketing tells us there's an easy answer for everything. And there's a magic pill and there's something you can buy to make your life perfect, whether it's deodorant or food delivered to your house or some sort of consumer product or the newest phone um, that all of a sudden you'll obtain 
enlightenment, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's almost advertising the sort of bliss-filled life that's just in the future, just around the corner. It only costs so much money. Uh, and bringing it into the, having the human experience, which is so important. I mean, I'm, of course, huge into psychology and counseling, and I'm trying to demystify those subjects uh, with this podcast and, and mental health. But and, and I know you're you're really into the medicine. You know about all the biological systems and uh, the functional medicine parts of the body, all these sort of things, and how the micronutrients relate, which I have no idea about. But we we have that science and that knowledge, but what's important to people is the human experience. Right. How does this translate? How does this give me meaning? How does this give me hope? And I think that you're you're working on giving people hope. And if you can go through this, so can they. Exactly. And you can transform. So can they. Absolutely. So, question. Did we cover emotional eating or do we need to hit more on that topic no i think uh, i think we covered it uh you know I'll, I'll just say that it's it's definitely a topic that we could have an entire episode on sure maybe you know that that's <laughs> it's definitely it's one of those things but uh and i, I do think it's something that a lot of us uh, experience even if it's at a much lower level um but what i really want to convey is that there are ways to overcome it yes. you know it's not something that you have to just actually can I, i'll share one quick uh quick story sure, so the absolutely. other day when i just a couple days ago i realized um you know that you know food is i said this to myself that well you know what i just have to become comfortable with the fact that food is always going to be a struggle for me hmm I caught myself right there. Why do I have to use the words food is a struggle? Yes. It's a continuous, I said a continuous struggle. Why do I have to use those words continuous struggle? Like if we're driving down the road, it's a straight road. What do you do with the, does this car just go straight? No, you're, you're always making the little adjustments of the uh, steering wheel, right? Yes. So what, I mean, do we call driving a down a straight road a continuous struggle because you have to keep <laughs> adjusting the steering wheel? Yeah. No, right? So why do we use that language? What if I just said food is going to be, my relationship with food is going to be a continuous adjustment? Now all of a sudden it's, it's not so negative. Like the language that we use is so powerful in every oh, aspect yes. of our psychology, right? I mean, you know this even better than I do, but <laughs> the uh, the the our memories exist because of language because we we think back on the past and we can put a time and a place and it has words as associated with it. that's how we remember it so language is incredibly powerful so one way that i've found uh you know literally in the last few days of finding uh you know redefining my relationship with food and emotional eating has been how can I structure my language and then keep keep firing that new pattern of language so that it goes from something that is um, difficult or a struggle mm -hmm. and if I turn it into opportunity you know on one hand it might sound a little cheesy but if you do it a few times then you start realizing wow this is a this is a completely different thing so like last night we had a we had a, a, a dinner party. A bunch of our friends came over. We had a wonderful feast, potluck kind of thing. And um, yeah, of course, I'm in the middle of this mastication <laughs> vacation, right? So like all this food that I couldn't, you know, eat. So what did I do? Brought the Vitamix. There you I go. Actually, I actually took a little bit of everything. And that will be my video today. But put it all in the Vitamix and um, blended it and just had, it was like a pudding with <laughs> <laughs> this Mexican food pudding it was delicious but uh, but nonetheless like that would have been a moment that in the past with I would have felt isolated alone mm. um, you know everybody else is able to enjoy but not me totally shifted that to a uh, hey this is going to be fun try this out and for you know a moment of, of time there it was this oh my god Karthik's going to blend all that is that going to blend and you're, <laughs> you're the center of attention and, like it was actually pretty fun so it's but it's all the perspective. 
It's all the language that we use around the food and the eating. This I have so much to say about this right now because I love that you took the risk of um, you know people making fun of you for bringing a blender to a party. <laughs> uh, instead of just bringing some juice that you had bottled over to the party and secretly drinking it in the kitchen, you went full on. I mean, if, if anyone has a blender at home, they're loud. Yeah. And you were yourself. You fully embraced yourself. And then what happened? People are always going to remember that party. Remember the time Karthik brought a blender to our party and <laughs> threw beans in it? Right. With some salad and juice? How weird was that? Yeah. But that's that's what makes life Beautiful is when we are ourselves. When Absolutely. we, when we, when, when I mean by that is I don't mean that we're the calloused self and the wound itself. Of course, that's part of life and that's part of the beautiful and dark side of life. But when we, we're really embracing what we really want to do, but then we have these filters saying, "Don't do that. Don't say that. Don't be honest. Don't be authentic. Yeah. Uh, do something to not. Don't draw attention to yourself, uh, or or draw attention to yourself in a bad way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, do something to draw attention in, 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 a, in a negative way. So I love that, and I feel like that's true to your journey. And I also heard you saying something about our language being so important, and I, I believe that because uh, there's this saying, um, you are not what you think. I have no idea who said that. But we all have wild and crazy thoughts all the time because our brain is always firing off information because that's the way it's supposed to be. And a lot of people don't know that a lot of thoughts are just phenomena. Right. And, uh, I mean, if you've ever been on a bridge, um, we have a range of emotions and thoughts while on a bridge. If we're high above and we're walking on this bridge, such as, oh my gosh, I hope this bridge holds, to, oh, what a beautiful view, to, what if I jumped off this bridge? Or what if I pushed somebody? Or what if I threw my thing over? Or, and then, of course, back to, why am I thinking that? That's insane. Let's go back to this beautiful view and take some pictures. Oh, I'm scared of heights. I, I mean, all these sort of, <laughs> this dialogue is going on in yeah. back while somebody's asking you about your vacation or what you're going to do and you're trying to pretend to have this surface conversation about the weather, you know, and, mm -hmm. oh, the weather's going to be great today on the bridge and, oh, this bridge was made in 1941 and blah, blah, blah. And and we're, we're talking about all these surface things, but meanwhile, we're having this, you know, dialogue that our our, our mind does automatically. Uh, everyone's mind does some type of automatic dialogue. And what I heard you saying was I caught myself saying that this is going to be a continuous struggle. And why do I, that was my automatic. So what I heard you do is pause. Mm -hmm. And instead of letting that be your narrative from here on out, you pause and said, wait a minute, I'm going to, I'm going to reframe that. And I'm going to turn that into, it's going to be an adjustment. And I would like to reframe it even further and say, what if food is a beautiful, wonderful journey for you? Yeah. And in and, and a few chapters of the book, you know, you went through the, the dark abyss of eating blockhead burritos and takeout, you know, delivered to your apartment. But now we're in this, this interesting part of the story, but we're still going and, and, and it will be interesting. And of course, we can all watch your journey now on the YouTube with the vicarium. Um, any last comments about that? Anything coming to your mind? No, I think that's uh, definitely quite a lot that we uh, we discussed there. That's true. I, I want to throw a few things in before I ask you, what are you into right now? Sure. Um, and then, of course, we'll get to the ending where I read you a lot of quotes and see what your reactions are to those. Okay. Um, I wanted to say, uh, you've inspired me. Uh, I found myself very stressed out last year due to some things I was in my personal life and work life. And I found myself eating ice cream every night before going to bed. And then uh, to cope with the month of June, it was very hot here in Arizona. And then I went on vacation and I was so excited on vacation because I went somewhere not hot. And I was so excited because this place has a lot of local foods course grand rapids where i'm moving here in a few months and they have all this local food and, and local things to eat and fresh baked croissants and you know all this great midwestern food and so i found myself indulging so much so that i gained 10 pounds mm -hmm. in about two months <laughs> which i was like wait a minute here i, I and, and not that weight is a big thing to me because it's not i don't weigh myself normally but when i was on the beach I saw pictures of myself and I was like, wait a minute, 
where is this giant man gut coming from? I don't want this. This looks terrible. Like I want to, I want to get it back in shape because I used to do a lot of yoga and a lot of running and biking and things. And I was like, this is, this is not me. And I kind of just sort of moderately cut back on the ice cream. I didn't buy any. I stopped eating croissants. I started taking breaks from foods, but I didn't lose any weight. Mm -hmm. And I did some exercise, but I wasn't all in and I haven't, you know, devoted myself to exercise all in again. I was just doing the minimum. But then you told me about what you were going to do. You told me in December, I'm going to start this 108-day mastication vacation to come o overcome food addiction and emotional eating. And I said, okay, well, um, I'm not going to that extreme level, but I'd love to lose this little man gut. So I, <laughs> so I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start just watching my intake of food in December, just watching what I do. And I started watching myself and listening and, and seeing my habits. And then, so I said, okay, you know what I'm going to do in January? I'm going to make this easy. I'm doing no dairy January. So I did no dairy, no eggs for the whole month of January. And it went well. I, I don't think I was 100%. I, I think I was probably a 90%. So I got A minus. But hey, it, uh, it helped. I started feeling better. Um, I started feeling more energy. Um, I, I, I lost a few pounds. I don't religiously weigh myself. I don't advise anyone to do that. I just randomly saw that I lost a few pounds. And then in, uh, and now I'm in February. I'm in no bread Fre February. No bread February. And doing pretty well. I uh, had a slip up with a vegan brownie the other day. <laughs> but <laughs> other than that, I have had no bread, no processed crackers, um, no tortillas, uh, no pancakes, nothing. No croissants, awesome. Awesome. no bagels, and I feel wonderful. So in March, I don't know yet. I'm thinking about no meat March. We'll find out um, what what if I decide to keep going with this. But you've inspired me, so I appreciate that. And I'm feeling better, and I, I feel like I can go to the beach now and uh, – not have you know the inner tube around me right now That's so awesome. I, it's it's already pretty much gone so uh i think this is something that can i mean help everybody it helped me where i'm at and i don't know where our listeners are at i'm not sure where they're at i mean they may be in a very dark place uh i'm not sure and um you know we're having you know positive attitude and smiling right now but i know f for a long time it was very difficult and i saw even with my own eating that I could have just continued telling myself, oh, well, I need this ice cream. Oh, well, I need this. I need this. I need this. It's available. I'm on vacation. Da, da, da. All these sort of rationalizations. I right. could have continued with that story. And then I said, well, wait a minute. What, what if I don't need this? What if I just need enough to be nourished? What? And I don't count calories. I, I don't count anything. I just, I'm going with my intuition based on a small guideline. Right. Don't eat this this month. That's it change nothing else in my diet. And uh, so it, everyone's got their own way of doing it. So if you do do it, do it, I, I would say, get a naturopathic doctor or mm -hmm. some sort of nutrition expert to help you out. Um, and I think it helps with self-esteem because I'm feeling better about myself. And I think also when you're in that bad habit, there is a mindset of, well, I've already gained this much weight. What the heck is this cookie gonna matter oh yeah so i feel oh, like yeah. when we're already feeling bad about ourselves it's a downward spiral mm -hmm. and it takes a while to get results where you actually start feeling good about yourself right whether it's mindset or eating yeah because uh, i think for a while i did not look any different i i think for basically the whole month of january i only noticed a little bit of change in the last five days was where i noticed i had lost some weight and didn't have this bigger gut so, okay. Um, comments yeah, before we get to the well, I think, uh, quote round. That, that's awesome, the, the progress that, uh, that you made. Thank um, you. I'm glad that I was able to inspire you to do that. Um, and I was really, what you, what you said there uh, toward the end about, um, you know, when we're in kind of that negative state where, oh, what's another cookie? I totally know what that feels like. I mean, that, that's like... When I hit 200 pounds again, when I came back up and hit 200 pounds, I was like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This is the worst. I can't do this again. I, 
I got to go down. And then when I wasn't doing anything about it, then I let it myself go up to 215 without, no, like, what does it matter? I'm already the opposite. Right. Right. Um, and I also, what you said about, um, you know, you, it, it's hard to turn that around and see the results. And if that's where, if you, you're weighing yourself every day, you can really get in your head about it because, uh, you, you're not going to see a change from day to day. Right. Or sometimes even week to week, the change might be minor. Sure. Or even, and think about it, if you're weighing every week, but then you just happen to be, maybe you consumed a little bit too much sodium the night before, then uh, you go in for that, that weigh-in, the once a week weigh-in, and you're retaining a little extra water oh. than you normally would have. I, I mean, there's so many things come into play. So, many so instead of, I mean, look, I, I'm a scientist. I, I actually am recording my weight on a daily basis with this vlog i'm just not looking i'm letting the fitbit oh scale that's right work. the fitbit yeah the fitbit scale is recording it i'm test. it's a bl i'm not looking yeah. at it i'm not looking at it but it's recording it so after this is done i'll go back and i'm just curious i'm you know but um instead of focusing on the weight as the outcome when you're making that turnaround if you focus your success and feeling good about yourself on your effort uh, so when you, so for me, when I started this, I said, all right, uh, I'm not going to focus on my weight for this mastication vacation. It's not about weight loss. This is about redefining my relationship with food, overcoming food addiction. So, uh, day one. Okay. Did I not chew today? Success. Did I make a vlog today? Success. I feel good. So your That's effort. It. Effort. It's the, all in the effort. Not about the result. About because the effort. Because when you put in the effort, yes. you feel the growth. And as long as you feel like you're growing, as long as you feel like you're growing, you don't need that ice cream. It's when you feel stuck that you want that ice cream. That Oh my gosh. I love it. I, that is fantastic. When you are growing, then you have the meaning and you have the hope and you have the drive to continue, even if it's hard. Did I chew today? No. Did I make the vlog today? Yes. Those are the two factors I'm grading. That's my effort. I'm, I've got these rules. Here I go. And, and it's when you're stuck and you're feeling there is no goal. What is my goal? I don't have any definables. I don't have any uh, small little things I'm doing in my it's life. It's about I'm just controlling sort of... the things you can control. Ah, uh, yes. Can you control the weight on the scale? Yeah, indirectly, of course you could. Sure, but... if you really, in an yeah. unhealthy way even. Yeah, even in an unhealthy way. But, you know, choose something that you can directly control. Can I directly make juices and smoothies and whatnot and eat t and consume food that way today? Yes. Can I directly control making a video? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Right. Because there's so That's much it. we can't control in life. Right. We've got to be open to. That's right. I love it. I love it. Uh, very practical, very down to earth advice. So we're all about that here on this podcast. Um, I want to hear about briefly what you're now interested in. I'm interested right now in the psychology behind exercise as well as vicarium is all about lifestyle medicine for the practical person right mm -hmm. the, the, how do i eat healthy on a budget how do i eat healthy when i don't have time how do i you know all these things like what are the things that i need to do to improve the quality of my life uh and that's lifestyle medicine i'm interested in the exercise component of it because i've just never stuck to it for a very long time at a stretch. I said I did P90X. That was awesome. I did another program, DDP Yoga, for a few months. That was amazing. And um, and w again, when I get on a roll, I can do it in extremes. It's sure. It's like all or nothing. And uh, and for the longest time, I, I just couldn't figure out why that was. And, and I just, the other day, realized uh, you know, that I think it, it actually relates to something that happened when I was seven. And really, it's just been living in me the whole time. Um, basically, if I can go into that story sure. real quick, Feel yeah. Free so, uh, when I was seven, uh, living in Colorado, uh, I was in uh, a little, basically, a track club and uh, track and field thing, and uh, there was this race. And I was really excited for it because my parents were there; they were watching. Uh, friends were there. You know, we're we're all doing this race. We start running this race, and as it was, I was a little pudgier kid, you know. Unfortunately, by today's standards, that wouldn't be pudgy, but at least back then it was. Right. Um, and uh, and I started falling behind, 
the others. And then I started just trying to run harder, breathe heavier, started feeling abdominal cramping just mm. from the, you know, like hypoxia of the whole thing, like just not being able to, 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 to breathe deeply. And, uh, and I was, I started falling behind and behind and behind to the point that I couldn't see the kids in front of me. And uh, I just remember feeling so sad and I couldn't run anymore. So I just started walking and everybody was long done, but I didn't quit. I just kept going and eventually finished. Uh, and I just remember feeling so sad and mm -hmm. slow that, you know, I wasn't able to keep up with these other kids. And I just felt like, oh, damn. You know, you're a seven-year-old. There's, yeah. there's not much verbal meaning you're assigning to it other than just an emotion, a very strong emotion. Yes. And since then, uh, or and after then, I, I did play some basketball uh, when I was in elementary school and whatnot. And I was one of the taller kids, so that helped me with basketball. But anytime we had to do full court, that was, you know, same thing. Couldn't run for distance or duration. Mm. Um, but half court was fine. Um, anyways... That was great until everyone else grew taller than me. Uh, and then the basketball uh, went out the door <laughs> as well. Yeah. And I, I just started, you know, continued gaining weight. And once you're really heavy, it's even harder to run because then it physically hurts your your shins and your feet and whatnot. So, um, and uh, as an adult, I'm like, wow, why am I not able to stick to an exercise program for a, a long enough period of time? Right. You know, like... I, I just I can never see myself as an like visualize myself as an athlete that kind of thing, um, and now looking back, even when I visualized the ideal Dr. Ramanan, I didn't visualize athlete. I visualized hmm. just lean, lean Dr. And Ramanan. lean, yeah. and he exercises like this vague term of he exercises, <laughs> right? But it's not like an actual vision of this guy that that can uh, you know maybe run a half marathon or a marathon or whatever the case may be, right? So anyway, um, but this occurred to me. Like, I forgot that story of me as a seven-year-old. Mm. Like, I didn't even remember it until a, a few weeks ago, and then I was pondering it more recently and just realized, that, well, you know what? If in my childhood, if it started in that moment and it continued through those, let's say, basketball years and, and whatnot, and, and then certainly after that where I'm slow, I can't, I can't keep up with the other kids. I can't do this for very long because I can't sustain a work, you know, running for very long. Then what would, how would an adult all of a sudden be able to make exercise part of his lifestyle if ingrained in him is this self image that I can't do this? Right, like how image is, and belief, image seems, and belief system. Yeah, it sounds yeah, like that both you, that are you, there that negative I, cognitions about yourself. Exactly, and so of course it makes sense now, mm. you know. And uh, because I always admired the people that were like they they just wake up and they exercise, like they go for their right. workout. They just like they wouldn't brush their teeth and they wouldn't not brush their teeth in the morning. They wouldn't not exercise. It's sure. just what they do. And I talk to them. I'm of, I'm of the belief that like, if you want the results that somebody else has, if you want to be a certain way, like somebody else is then figure out what their habits, routines and practices are and copy them. Because, Absolutely. you know, we're born with some stuff, but for the most part, I think a lot of us, a lot of who we are is, is by practice and by, um, implementation uh, over the course of time and so i would admire these people like so you you for you exercise is like almost a meditative like it's time for yourself time to take care of yourself to love yourself mm. and i just never saw it that way because i'd be like even if i were you know intensely working out three to five days a week for three months straight uh there'd still be this little bit of a sense of when is it going to end or you know <laughs> when am i going to stop right. or it, it was it was still an effort and not an act of self love and mm. now just very recently i've become more interested in the psychology behind that so that how can i shift that so that i acknowledge the 7 year old within me who is having those experiences and what if i can learn something new from that that maybe it's not i'm too slow maybe instead i could learn I never 
never give up. Change the story. Change the story. I there are so many things from psychology and counseling that I would say to recommend to you. Um, obviously, working with your own counselor would be the best idea uh, for everyone listening. The same advice goes to them. But there's little things you can do that anybody can do, like journaling, yeah. um, reflecting, drawing that image. Um, yeah. Now, in if I was working with you as one of the clients I was working with, I would probably do a, a combination of things. But for that thing, you have a specific memory that keeps coming up. So something about that memory, that image, that negative cognition that that seven-year-old implanted uh, is stuck in your psyche. So I would probably do something with EMDR therapy, mm -hmm. eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy, which I'll talk about on another podcast, which was developed for trauma, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, but works great uh, for performance and people getting past stuck place they're just not sure why there's this thing and i don't know why i can't do it or it keeps stopping me or i keep getting stuck and i, I hear that with exercise for you and then all of a sudden it dawned on you i think you're doing a lot of self-work um oh my seven-year-old self so i would probably investigate that might be something what you would call an emdr a keystone memory um and when, and when children are young we have an absolute concrete black and white thinking style, and that's normal for all children. So when things happen to children and they don't have the language and they don't, you know, lots of things, maybe they don't, nobody's explaining to them, uh, the adults aren't explaining, or at that time they're not explaining what's happening and guiding them through it, um, something can happen to a child. And what happens is instead of going, oh, well, that was a bad situation let's fix that or let's move on they go i'm bad or right. or my life is fated to be terrible or i'm not safe or i should have done something different i'm an idiot and this sticks with them because it's this concrete thought it's not abstract and it sticks and so that memory is almost not chronological mm -hmm. that memory is almost out of time because if i say hey remember colorado when you were seven boom does that memory come up for you yeah it's right there. I mean, you um, have, have been dwelling and thinking about this memory for a while. So just as for the people out there in podcast listening land, it's important to get with a counselor if you've got a memory or some sort of negative self-belief that continues um, on. And I know, Karthik, because I've known you, I know you're going to pursue this. And there's so many ways. That's just one way. I mean, that's just EMDR. There's plenty of other types of therapy. There's plenty of self things you can do self-work you can do on yourself um, to overcome that difficult memory slash story slash negative cognition about self that seems to be some somehow affecting you in this weird unconscious way. Because it's like, I know you want to exercise. You did P90X. I can't handle that. I mean, come on, that's a warrior type thing to do. But then it's like, oh, when is it done? Mm -hmm. and, and then like I see Dr. Raman on in the future, but it's this vague thing about exercising. It's not definable. Mm -hmm. It's almost cloudy. It's like something is clouding your experience. So, um, thoughts? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's definitely something I will pursue. It's, uh, it, makes, it makes so much sense. And, and actually that aspect about Dr. Ramanan and his uh, exercise mm -hmm. being a cloudy thing, I didn't even realize that part until right now. Oh, really? Speaking. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, like, yeah, you know what I... I outlined so much, but no, he exercises. That was it. Yeah, that was it. Of, sort of you vaguely. Know? Yeah, it's like, oh yeah, he did. He um, does his finger exercises. Right. <laughs> so, in any case, but look, uh, I think um, you know my my passion in sharing all of this is is again just because uh, I just want people to see that we're we're all capable of doing amazing things. Uh, just because we're in a certain state, whether it's rock bottom or just some pl murky place in between where we just feel stuck, that there are things we can do. It doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. and yes. it, but it takes, it takes uh, consistent, intentional action. It, whatever you do, you got to be consistent about it. You have to have the right intentions. 
Mm -hmm. and you have to take action. Any of them without the other, you just, you're not going to get to where you want to be. Absolutely. And for some people, you know, that is exercising with a a personal trainer or a buddy. Mm -hmm. And that's, and for some people, you know, on a budget, which I've been most of my life, that could just be calling a friend and saying, hey, make sure I jog with you Tuesday. Um, For other people, you know, that may be going to a therapist. Maybe that's all I can do. I can drag myself intentionally and consistently to a therapist once a week or a naturopathic doctor. That's about all I've got. Everything else, all my priorities, I don't know what you mean by being intentional. This is too difficult right now. I'm going through too much to prioritize that, but I could probably sit there. For other people, they may say, okay, well, I'm going to start journaling. I'm going to start reading books. I'm going to start using education as power. I'm going to start getting accountability. I'm going to go to groups. I'm going to go socially, and I'm going to go to a counselor, and I'm going to go to a doctor. But we all have what we can do, and we're all doing the best we can. Yes. And so we have to remember, but whatever you're going through, yes, you can change. There are people that are, are uh, their vocation is to help you change, and it is research to work, and we know it works. And just if you look at human history, a lot of people, you know, for thousands of years, there was a story circle in many different cultures, and people transformed through story, and they held on to these stories, and they told the stories right. um, in so many different cultures, and so getting with the elders who usually told the stories, like in the Irish culture, um, they had the storytellers and, and so many other cultures. That's just one example that comes to mind. You would come listen to the elders and they would tell stories of transformation and even fables and story, Mm -hmm. um, sort of tales like that can help us. Yeah. And stories are, are are so powerful and it, you know, we're, you know, I, I shared my story today uh, there, there are other stories out there that inspire us, and one of the things that I've, that I often uh, talk to my patients about is <clears throat> what you're going through right now. In many cases, they're in a lot of pain, mm-hmm. or they're suffering, uh, and but they have some. They want to do something about it. That's why they're seeking help. Right. Right. And I invariably find that all of them have something to say about oh i wish i had known this or i wish if if i could tell another person about what i went through so that they wouldn't have to go through it Mm -hmm. there's some element of that in almost everybody and what is that it's their story so what i what i ask my patients is you know what if, what if, try this on, just like a coat. You can try it on. If you don't like it, discard it, right? What if what you're going through right now is allowing you to write a story that will help a lot of other people later? Would it be worth it right now? Mm-hmm. Yes. And looking back at my past self for all the suffering that I've been through, absolutely worth it. Absolutely worth it. That is very powerful, Karthik. I appreciate you sharing that. I think that is great, and I'm really hoping uh, we some people really get something out of this today. Um, stories are powerful. I appreciate you telling your story. Um, so, yeah, I don't have any. That's I don't have any more comments on that. I I agree hundred percent. I think it was that was beautiful. Um, I am now going to put you on the hot seat, though. Right. So we're going to sh- totally this. shift from uh, that. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to read you some quotes about eating and food. Okay. And I really don't want you to analyze too much. So I want you to turn off your analytical science brain. Right, we'll and try. I want you to give me your thin <laughs> slicing into it, intuitive gut. Okay. And you can, of course, filter this through whatever you want. Got it. So Virginia Woolf said, One cannot think well, love well, sleep well. If one has not dined well, hmm. yeah, I think uh, it just goes back to you have to nourish your body. You, you, we are what we eat. We've heard that for the longest time, but it's actually true. Like if you eat crappy food, your cell membranes are built, among other things, are built on the crappy food that you've been eating. So, right. like if if 
if uh, we've been designed to consume certain foods to become who we are and we stop doing that we're just we're physically an inferior version of ourselves hmm. so of course you can't think well tr- all the things that she sleep said. well sleep love well, well all those things if, yeah. you, if you're if you're eating terrible food it, right that reminds me of of somebody i i heard this story that they they were depressed for years and they had been um feeling their main complaint was sluggish tired um couldn't sleep well stomach hurt and so their doctor had diagnosed them with major depression and some anxiety and had given them a bunch of medications um and uh they'd been on for years and they just kept going up in dose and nothing was working and they were just so tired they couldn't even leave the house and then somebody asked them well what are you eating Mm -hmm. and they said well fast food and junk food yeah and uh they said well what if you try changing your diet and they were like i don't know and and they they did and eventually they found that most of their depression Mm -hmm. was because somehow related to what they were eating yeah. Because when they when they changed their diet due to the health, I think they were working with some nutritionist professional and Weight Watchers or something like that. They um, they totally like some more like I don't know you can't really give numbers, but let's just say fifty to seventy percent of their depression was gone, and they were able to figure out what they were actually depressed about. And they yeah. found out that they were lethargic and tired and feeling like junk because they were eating junk. Right. And that's literally what they said to me. Well, in naturopathic medicine, we talk about removing the obstacles to cure. Mm-hmm. For a lot of us, the, what we put in, our, put in our mouths is an obstacle to cure. So I totally get that. And I've experienced some of that myself, too. So that actually was funny because the next quote I was going to say was, Tell me what you eat and I will tell you who you are. <laughs> by somebody named... Somebody I, named Saverin. But anyway, we'll, we'll skip that comment because I feel like that's almost the same thing we just said. So here's here's uh, Hippocrates said this. Let food be thy medicine. Thy medicine shall be thy food. Comments. Oh, yeah. Uh, we uh, we recite that one <laughs> quite a bit as naturopathic physicians. Uh, it's so true. It's so true. Um, honestly, uh, I've worked with patients that have been uh, very diabetic type 2 diabetic, Mm -hmm. and uh, they did not want to go down the path of metformin and and whatnot, so they said, okay, let's implement a nutrient-dense plant-rich diet. doesn't necessarily mean a vegan diet. Sure. It means a nutrient-dense means lots of vegetables and fruits and nuts, seeds, beans, that kind of thing. Right. Um, Not just meat and cheese? Right. Bread? Exactly. Okay. And potatoes? Uh, No refined carbohydrates okay. and junk food. And so wait, no stuff. ramen? No, no, definitely. Okay. So we, uh, you know, and patients that had been on, that we, we put on that type of diet style and uh, reversed diabetes. So that is food being medicine. Wow. And if, if there's, like the diabetes is a result of not eating that way. The type 2 diabetes. The type 2 literally diabetes. comes from eating this sort of food and gaining this sort of weight and it, causes what some sort of metabolic change or what yeah. happens yeah basically i mean it's uh, type 2 diabetes is uh, insulin resistant so the, there's blood sugar that the, the sugar can't get into the cells oh um and uh you know there are various ways of trying to to fix that sure um but fundamentally you know the the patients that that we've that i've been able to see through my attending physicians uh at at scnm uh we've taken the approach of let's just Let's just go right back to the basics. Oh yeah, of the food, and if that doesn't work, then we have other options. Sure, too. absolutely. But let's start there. Start with the basics. Let's start with the basics, and the food be thy medicine. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay, so here we go. This one's a little complicated. The spirit cannot endure the body when overfed, but if underfed, the body cannot endure the spirit. That was St. Francis de Sales. So the spirit cannot endure the body when overfed. Let's go there first. The spirit cannot endure what the body's going through when overfed. Yeah, I, well, that I can relate to. Right? Um, yeah, when you're in that state of gluttony, uh, you, your spirit is just depressed. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about, you know, mentally depressed. I'm just talking about you, you just 
the vitality your of vitality, yourself. Vitality, right? Your purpose, your meaning, your nothing. It's just not there, or it's diminished. Um, it's it's like imagine that food coma state, but you're in like a little bit less than a food coma state all the time. Mm. Uh, and actually, it's never been more clear to me <clears throat> uh, the the power of the body to suppress the spirit in that way with too much food until I've done fasting, mm. um, either juice fasting or even more so water fasting, where your the body is purely in a state of purging. And that is when the spirit, my at least my spirit, has been even more elevated. And just read anybody's experience on on true water fasting. Again, medically supervised. Sure. But, <laughs> Disclaimer. Uh, yeah, but nonetheless, like in that state, um, the spirit is just so alive. My my mind and spirit have never been cleaner and more powerful than when I'm in those states of, of fasting. Wow. Yeah. So you're getting a lot of mental clarity yeah. and sort of purpose and sort of that. Well, yes, that larger part of our humanity, which is our, our soul or spirit. Right. What was the second part it? of that quote? Uh, the second part was, uh, if underfed, so we have some people that go to extreme measures to not eat in a in a negative way, right. the body cannot endure the spirit. The body can't endure the spirit. Um, you know, if I'm thinking underfed in the form of starvation, I can't really relate to that. Sure. Right, because I haven't been there. Sure. Um, if we're saying underfed in the in terms of uh, nourishment, because of let's say micronutrient. Sure, they were talking about food, I believe. Food. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know what? I, I think um, I think I would see that as uh, when when you're chronically in a state of not giving your body what it deserves. Sure. Over the course of time. The spirit will take over at mm. some point. That's what happened with me. Yeah. Right? Where I said enough is enough. I have to do something about this. I love it. Two more. Short and easy one. All right. Here's an easy one. Yeah. This should be a, a, a base hit. One should live... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not for me you to get it say out of it. your mouth, right. yes. <laughs> one should eat to live, not live to eat. Benjamin Franklin. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. So, do we even need to say anything? Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, live to eat is what I was... Uh, that's the food addictive state, right? Yeah. I mean, you're just... You're living just to get to the next opportunity to put something in your mouth and chew it and taste it and whatnot. And that's not really living. No. And then eat to live is this. You know, to somebody else, I'm, I'm holding a uh, formerly full... 32 ounce cup of green juice over the course of this interview this has been consumed but uh you know somebody might look at this and be this is disgusting right mm -hmm. i look at it and say this is life mm. you know uh, this to me is this is like drinking all the vitality that's in all of these vegetables that went into this juice and to me this is this is the elixir of life yeah Right? This is eating to live. Yes. Does it, is this a brownie? No. Sure. Far from it. <laughs> to me, it tastes good now because I've adjusted to it, but this is eating to live. I love it. Last quote. Yeah. Now I'm going to preface this with who said it because we love this guy in our culture, Thomas Edison. All right. Um, Thomas Edison said that the doctor of the future will give no medicine but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. And I believe, I don't know when he said this, but it was probably about 100 years ago, if not more. Yeah, that's, uh, boy, I tell you what, uh, if that isn't what we're trying to do as naturopathic physicians, I don't know what is. Uh, that's, that's exactly what we're trying to uh, help people achieve. Um, Ideally, right, the patients that I work with, I want to, I, I, I don't want them to come back. I don't want, you know, not to sound bad about sure. it, but it's like, you we know, like I want them sure. to get better so that they don't have to come back to me. I'd like to keep in touch, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's um, that through education, through uh, that uh, this notion that 
me as the doctor or future doctor really uh, is I'm not providing the healing. A drug is not providing the healing. Even the diet's not providing the healing. Mm-hmm. It's that person who's providing their own healing, right? That uh, that all we do, doctor. The word doctor comes from Latin "docere," it means to teach. Yes. So, to I take that very seriously. So I can teach about nutrition. I can teach about mind body medicine. I can teach about strategies that that people can use to implement lifestyle medicine. And in doing so, for most chronic disease, at least say the top fifteen killers of uh, of Americans, sure. chronic disease wise, can be prevented or reversed with even just diet, let alone with exercise, lifestyle. mindfulness, mm-hmm. sleep, stress all those reduction, other stress reduction. Yeah. So I love it because uh, he says the doctor of the future will give no medicine, no drugs, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame. So literally, he's saying that people will care about themselves. And if you care about yourself, then you're going to think about your diet. You're going to think about your lifestyle. You're going to think about your stress. And that is going to cause and prevent most diseases, not all, but a lot of there's a lot of preventable diseases in the United States. Obviously, when necessary, we're going to need those antibiotics or antivirals or whatever to help us in a, in a, in a pinch. Yeah. But in the for the average person, they can completely feel better. They can sleep better. Um, they can live better. They can have more mental clarity just by doing what, I guess, what naturopathic medical doctors are now promoting. Which is what Thomas Edison said, and he was a very innovative person, as yeah, we know that he was. from history. That he was. So I'm excited about this um, naturopathic medicine. Uh, just for people that don't know, uh, people go to a four year medical school that's accredited. Uh, there's a number of them. I believe you guys are licensed now in 22 yeah, states. I believe that's number 22. 22 states now in the United States, and there are. I've heard legislation pending in about eight states mm-hmm. to make sure that uh, people can get um, alternative or adjunctive health care um, and a lot of primary care yeah. type type situations and some specializations. But you guys don't really do surgery or broken limbs. It's, it's uh, a lot of other things, but mm-hmm. mental health, physical health, um, uh, thyroids, stomach problems i i i you could, the list goes on yeah. look it up if you're interested naturopathic medicine that from accredited medical school mm-hmm. um you learn all the modalities a a md or do learns plus alternative modalities correct and, uh, combining science with uh sort of ancient practice getting back to basics mm-hmm. so last thing here is um so this podcast is the intentional clinician and I work at a place called Health for Life Grand Rapids, which I am co-founding. And one of our taglines is when where transformation begins. And I love transformation because it's not just getting rid of some symptoms and giving somebody a quick fix. It's completely changing form so that you almost don't recognize yourself in the future. Yes. So, but everyone's got their own take on that. So Karthik, what does transformation mean to you? Hmm. Transformation means living a life that is free of the burdens from the past that history doesn't dictate destiny it's lifestyle design it's life design that this is my purpose this is my my mission and this is what my life is about. It's having the freedom to do that. Um, and we all come from different backgrounds. We all come from different experiences that have happened in our lives. And I believe in the core of my being that all of us are worthy and capable of having the life that we want. Uh, one of our doctors, uh, one of our teachers at school, uh, Dr. Nick Baradovich says something that's, that I just love. And he says, uh, healing is very simple. It's not easy. 
Hmm. And transformation, I think, is the same way. Yes. It can be very simple. It's not easy. Yes. It takes work. But it's so worth it. Yes, it does take work. It takes changing what we're doing. I love it. It is so worth it. Um, I think I want to leave our listeners with that. Healing is simple, but it's not easy. But it's so worth it. Thank you, Karthik, for coming on the show, also known as the future Dr. Ramanan. And people can get a hold of you how? Yeah, so they can get a hold of me at vicarium.com, as well as my social media outlets. So facebook.com slash vicarium. Uh, I'm on Instagram, at vicarium. Uh, And of course, my YouTube channel, uh, vicarium.com slash YouTube. And vicarium, that's V-I-C-A, sorry, V-I-C... A R I U M. <laughs> okay, awesome. And I will definitely be putting that information in the show notes um, for those of you who want to click on something. All right, it's been my pleasure to have Karthik here. This has been the Intentional Clinician with Paul Krauss, licensed professional counselor. All right, I'll see you or hear you or talk to you guys all on the flip side. So I just wanted to take a minute to thank everyone who listened to the podcast today. I appreciate your support. If you have any comments, you can leave them on this blog post, or you can email me, and you can get a hold of me at healthforlifegr.com or paulkrauscounseling.com. And if you're in need of a counselor in you're not in Grand Rapids or Michigan, uh, you can go to psychologytoday.com and check out counselors that way or just use the internet make sure they are licensed and i really appreciate your support if you're in need of a counseling supervisor i also do that you can go to counselingsupervisorgr.com you can also give me a call at 616-200-4433 with any questions and just to let you know in the next few weeks there will be more shows coming I've got several interviews logged and also some great content where I'm talking solo about the research of counseling and other topics related to mental health and psychology. All right, until next time, this has been Paul Krauss, Licensed Professional Counselor, and this is The Intentional Clinician. listen to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss, and while these are based upon literature he has read and his experience in the field of psychology, they should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on the subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment or any other advice or consulting. If you are in need of counseling or consulting or advice, don't hesitate to make an appointment with one of the local counselors in your area. If you're in the Grand Rapids area or in Michigan, You can make an appointment with Paul or one of his associates by emailing or calling the office. The information for this is on healthforlifegr.com or paulkrauscounseling.com. If you are in need of a counseling supervisor, you can go to counselingsupervisorgr.com. If you are in crisis, please call 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Line, 1-800-273-8255. All right, have a great day.
test the audio, what I want to do is we're just like talking to each other like this. Right. And I'm going to ask you a weird question. Okay. So, <clears throat> if you were at a diner in New York, what diner would that be? Diner in New York. Uh, there's one in Kingston, New York that my family and I used to go to a lot called Enzo's. And that place was basically our go-to for celebration. So anytime that uh, I did well on a test, mom got a promotion, whatever the case may be, we would go there to celebrate. So uh, it would be nice to go back if I okay. were to pick one place. Okay. Sounds like a Manhattan adventure is in store, perhaps. In the future? Uh, Manhattan, yeah, in the future. Or Kingston, where's that? Kingston's a little more upstate. Upstate? Yeah, more rural. Okay. Uh, Manhattan. Up by Sarah Lawrence? There's, uh, not sure. Okay. Yeah, uh, Manhattan, there's plenty of places I want to go there in terms of uh, vegan restaurants and whatnot. But... Oh, right. There's some in the East, there's one in the East Village I like. Yeah. I can't remember what it's called, but it's been open since the 70s. Well, my previous favorite one uh, closed down, Pure oh. Food and Wine. Wasn't a, that a scandal? So. A scandal, <laughs> unfortunately. Isn't that, isn't that how most things close? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, see what happened.